Zoom call. Um, you know me, uh, I'm Nouriel Grubini, professor of economics at the Stern School of Business at NYU. I'm uh, one of the few economists who's known as having predicted the global financial crisis. I write uh, regularly, I tweet, uh, I provide research services. And most of the work I've been done over the year has been both uh, qualitative and quantitative. And about a year ago, I joined up with a very good friend of mine. We've known each other for over 20 years, uh, a portfolio manager, one of the best I know, David Brown, who trades and also uses uh, algorithmic techniques to try to predict uh, uh, the turning point of the cycle for some key asset prices. So we figured out that in addition to a more qualitative analysis, we needed also a quantitative tool that could be used as a way of signaling when uh, key asset prices, US and global equities, oil, gold, US treasuries are either overbought or oversold. And we realized that in addition to what the data suggests, algorithmic, you also need a macroeconomic layer. Because of course, uh, those uh, peaks and throats of the cycle for major asset classes are driven by macroeconomic and financial news and shocks. So it's a quantitative approach, uh, but it has also this macroeconomic layer. So it's a combination of the most best of both. Uh, we've been testing it. It has been able to predict uh, most of the uh, overbought cases in the US in the last 10 years for the US equity markets, whenever there was a correction or a bear market. So we launched it. Uh, those of you who are using it are here today. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you. So what we're gonna be doing right now is gonna be that first, uh, David is gonna present you some of the technical details of uh, this approach. Then I'm gonna say something about uh, the macro layer, and then we're gonna open it up uh, to Q&A. For the time being, all of you are on mute, um, you know, until we finish our presentation. And then we're gonna one by one allow you to unmute yourself and ask your questions, and we're gonna answer them. And uh, if you want to ask a question, maybe, I think there is an option about raising your hand or flagging yourself so that we're going to look at the list of participants and decide one by one who should be asking a question live and then we're going to be answering it. So at this point, I'm going to pass the mic to my friend and colleague, uh, David Brown, uh, for his presentation, followed by mine and followed by the Q&A. And thanks again for being here today. David? Thank you so much, Nouriel. And I just wanted to say that at the end of this presentation, uh, our subscriber will vote to see who is the more good looking and more intelligent <laughs> between me and you. <laughs> but anyhow, um, first of all, I would like to the say- The two might be uncorrelated. We are uncorrelated. Not necessarily, the, the best looking might be the smartest or vice versa, so. Yeah, there is no correlation. It's inversely correlated. Um, but first of all, uh, thank you, Nouriel, for your presentation. And uh, I would uh, like to send uh, first uh, all my positive wishes uh, to all the uh, coronavirus victims around the world and also the healthcare uh, staff, uh, which are uh, like soldiers going into the hospitals every day, taking care of, uh, of all the patients and uh, working several, um, um, I mean, uh, uh, hours and hours every day, night and day. And also, I would like to thank our subscribers. A lot of our subscribers, uh, they know that we are giving 50% of our revenues uh, this month, uh, actually the month of March, uh, to uh, non-profit, COVID non-profit. And some of our subscribers have also asked uh, if they could donate more. So uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have a button in our home screen that you can push. And I don't know if I have a, a share screen. Uh, if you can enable share screen, I can show you, but on the front page of our, um, of our website, there is a button and that's the first nonprofit COVID that gives 100% of, uh, um, um, of the money raised uh, to nonprofit to help. Uh, that's, that's the button, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it, Nouriel? Yeah, we do. Echo, you just press this button and you go directly to the nonprofit. And there is no salary paid, 100% of the money goes to the victims and to the healthcare provider. Now, um, let's go back to, uh, to our uh, website. Uh, I think that uh, the great thing of this website is that uh, we wanted to uh, provide uh, Main Street and not only Wall Street. 
with a very sophisticated tools uh, that has an economist, uh, one of the top 10 economists in the world, and uh, a fund manager like myself working together to provide a simple digital signal uh, for everybody to use. And uh, this is what banks do, this is what proprietary desks do, this is what hedge funds do, and this is also what uh, the central banks do. And uh, so we wanted to share our knowledge with the public and make it affordable to everyone. Again, it's very important. It's very simple because it's digital. There is a, a red boom when you're supposed to sell uh, or when you're supposed to, we don't like to use sell because we're not financial advisors, but we would like to say when you have to reduce exposure to an asset class and uh, there is a green uh, bust signal, so it's digital, red and green, when you're supposed to increase your exposure to that, uh, to that class. Um, again, um, it's, a, it's simple because it's digital, but the math behind uses, and the statistic uh, behind uses linear regression and, and on the volatility of the asset class. So two things that I would like to mention. Um, this is not, a portfolio allocation um, signal, meaning that you should all ask your investment advisor how to invest your money and uh, what to do with your own money. But this signal will tell you when an asset class is overbought. For example, on the S&P 500, when uh, a few weeks ago, when everybody was bullish, and uh, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Citigroup were giving um, um, target for the S&P at 3,600, our signal showed that the market was overextended and uh, overbought. This is, this is how you use the signal. So this is a different matrix for you to use and to have in your um, toolbox when you manage your own money. And at that point, we were telling uh, uh, in our website to reduce exposure to the S&P and to also reduce exposure to um, shares like Apple. How we choose those asset class is that we want to choose very liquid asset class that have market cap between half a, bill and half a trillion and uh, a trillion or over a trillion. So a lot of people have also asked us, uh, we'll go later answer all the question, why we don't use, for example, Tesla. Everybody wants to have the signal in Tesla. The market cap of Tesla is only 100 billion. So it could go, it could go to zero, because it's not systemic to the system, and it could go, Tesla could go to 3,000. So therefore, I would still know it will not work because it could remain overbought for an extended period of time or it could go to zero. While if you take uh, uh, the S&P, uh, it would be very difficult for the S&P to go to zero. And it also, it could not go, it could not have a melt up and go to 10,000 uh, in a few weeks. This is, so this is how we apply our signal to very liquid and very well capitalized asset classes. Um, so how, how, how can you use the signal? Well. When there is a boom, you should start reducing your exposure. And when there is a bust, you should supposed to increase your exposure. So S&P at 3,325, you should have reduced your, your exposure to that asset class. And when we published our green bust at 2,550, the the exposure that you took off the plate at 3,325, you were supposed to um, increase. Then it's very important how you look at the signal. Then Professor Nuri Rubin and I, we talked and we, we realized back then uh, a few days ago when the S&P was at 2,550 that the market was completely dislocated. We had, uh, there was forced liquidation on numerous asset class all the lever, many of the leverage portfolios were forcibly liquidated by banks and brokerage firms. REITs, they, they, they missed their margin calls with banks. In addition to that, there was the, obviously the uncertainty of the COVID-19 spread in the US, but we also had the oil crisis. 
because of Putin not agreeing with the Saudis, a reduction of production. So it was maybe we had two or three black swan all together at the same time. So although the market rallied after our green bust at 2,550, about 7%, we decided to downgrade the signal to blue bust because of this uncertainty. So um, some people ask me, but why is it not, why didn't you publish a new Red Bull? Because obviously after a 37% um, correction, the market is oversold. And uh, so there is no red boom. It's, it's, it's a green bust or a blue bust. And, and this is how um, our si signal work is exactly the opposite of Main Street wisdom. When the market is very high and it's very expensive, Main Street wisdom is that you're, you are bombarded with good news. The market is over 3,000. And everybody, all the main Wall Street houses, they give targets of 3,700. And you actually are in an overbought situation. So at this point, it's important that you have our signal in your option tools and understand that a lot of proprietary desk and a lot of hedge funds are actually selling the market or reducing their exposure, vice versa. When the market is very down like these levels and everybody is bearish as turn bearish and all the bullish people are gone, our signal, signal is measuring the oversold situation and it's actually giving you a signal to increase your exposure. It doesn't mean that you have to go all in and buy the market, but at 2,500, the market looks a lot better than 3,300. In addition, you have to also consider what Nouriel is saying because the situation is very complex and is very fluid because we don't know how the COVID-19 will progress in the world and in the US. So the signal has to be always taken into context with the macro analysis that we're producing and we are publishing on the website. So I don't know if Nouriel, you want to talk a little bit before I go and answer all the questions. I don't know if you want to talk about more about your uh, mic micro view of the world and uh, how this applies to, to our signal. Yeah, I'll say briefly something. I don't want to speak too long because I want to leave enough time for the Q&A. But as David pointed out, it's an integration between a, a quantitative approach that gives you a signal on whether a market is overbought or oversold. And... Uh, the underlying macroeconomic analysis that looks at uh, the macroeconomic news, in this case, the health news, and of course, uh, the policy news. Uh, one point, for example, our signal that the market was overbought for the S&P 500 was sent to you mid-January. This was well before we knew that uh, the coronavirus crisis would become a global pandemic. It was only mid-February when then the spread of the contagion in Italy led to a global market correction. And already mid-January, around January 17, we told you the market is overbought. Why? Because all the market signals that we had were that we were in a frothy equity market, that there had been a minor melt-up into the fourth quarter and the beginning of 2020. And therefore, based on the macro, uh, macro signals and the positioning of the market and the market dynamics, this was a market was bubbly or frothy or overbought. Now, we could not predict mid-January that what would have led to a downturn in the market would be the coronavirus crisis because that was not yet a major global pandemic. But the market was already fundamentally overbought and any type of macroeconomic shock, including the coronavirus crisis, could have led to that market crash that did occur. And we had pointed out in a variety of factors that could lead to that outcome. Vice versa, when the market reached a level, it fell over 35%, and by mid March was at 2,250, the SP 500. Uh, we called for a green bus because the market signal was saying this the drawdown of 35% in a matter of literally less than a month means that there has been not just a change based on economic and macro fundamentals, but there has been also fire sales 
an undershooting in the same way in which by me generally had an overshooting. And guess what? When we called the signal that we were in a bust, it was time to increase exposure to S&P. Since then, the S&P has gone up uh, by about 7%. Now, the question mark, of course, is that from current level, the question that you have to ask yourself is whether this is a bottom and there'll be a significant recovery or whether there is still downside risk before we reach a recovery or whether we're gonna go further down and we're gonna have, so like in the 2007 and nine crisis, a 50 to 60% drawdown. So essentially, there are three scenarios. Scenario number one is in which the market fell 35% as recovered by about 10%, the way our market signal was suggesting. From this level, in our view, it could go lower if we have the greater recession. It could uh, test again the previous uh, bottom at the S&P of 2,250 before it's gonna start to recover in the second half of the year when there is more strong signal that the contagion of the virus is controlled and two, that the macroeconomic news are surprising to the upside rather than to the downside. So right now we are not in a bust, we're not in a boom, we're in the middle range. And depending on what happens to the macro, market can go lower, that's our baseline. We're gonna retest at some point the lows that we found about a few weeks ago, about uh, middle of March. Second scenario, of course, are those optimists who believe that this is gonna be a mild recession lasting only Q1 and Q2 and that by May or June, we'll have strong signals that we're controlling uh, the contagion, that the economic news are gonna improve faster than we expect, and we're gonna have positive growth already in the second half of the year. That will be the V-shaped recovery, the mild recession, as opposed to the greater recession and the U-shaped recovery. If that were to happen, of course, markets can rapidly accelerate upward significantly and go back to levels closer to those that they had at the beginning of the year. In our view, that's a low probability scenario. We think it's not more than 10, 15% probability, while our baseline of a greater recession is a probability of between 55 and 60%. And then, of course, there is a downside scenario. In a number of uh, speeches and, and talks and writings, I've said that this greater recession may end up into a greater depression. And if a greater depression were to occur, the market from current level can fall another 30 or 40% for a cumulative fall of 50 to 60%, like we saw at the peak of the crisis during the global financial crisis or during the Great Depression. That's, however, currently not our baseline. We think there is a significant risk, 25, 30% probability that this greater recession greater than the global financial crisis end up into a greater depression, but it is not the baseline. The baseline is one of the greater uh, recession. So the point that we're making is that we have uh, quantitative signals, and every time we provide a quantitative signal, we also provide a macro overlay that discusses what's happening to the economy, what's happening in this case on the health side and the spread of the contagion, and what's happening, of course, to the policy response whether we have bottomed out or whether this is just uh, recently a head fake rally or a dead cap bounce or whether we're going to have another leg down sharply or whether we're going to recover rapidly depends very much on the macro news on the policy news and on the health news but on top of it we have this uh, quantitative layer and we combine the quantitative layer with the economic analysis, the macro analysis, the policy analysis, the healthcare analysis to give you signals that combine quantity and quality. So it's an overlay between the two of them. And, uh, and the point that I want to make is also that we got right, not only the peak of the market in January of this year, after we gave a signal, the market went up only another 2% and then crashed by 35%. We also called the right, the bottom, that occurred when the S&P 500 reached uh, 2,250 uh, sometime in late March. But if you go back and look at the historical analysis, say going back to 2010, you have had at least uh, 10 episodes of a significant market correction, say in the S&P 500, 
our signal captures eight out of those 10 corrections. So we didn't get lucky twice in January and in March. If you look at the tool, it's a tool that actually goes back historically and can give you most of them, I would say 80% of the significant market correction that have occurred for the last uh, decade. So it's a model that is robust because it has a quantitative layer, but in each one of these episodes we called, we also provide a macro economic analysis of what were the economic and financial and the policy factor that led to those market correction. So it's a combination of a qualitative and a quantitative approach. Uh, I'll stop here for now and I'll pass it back again to, to David. Thank you, Nouriel. Uh, I don't know if you can still see the graph. Can you see a graph that I'm yeah. sharing? Yes. Okay, very good. No, first of all, I just wanted to make a correction, uh, um, is that our green bus signal was not at 2,200. Our green bus signal was at 2,550, just to point out. After we gave the signal at 2,550, the market rallied to 2,710. And uh, that was about a 7% uh, move upwards. Then we issued a warning that our signal wasn't robust enough because we were seeing that markets were breaking down because of the deleverage and, uh, and the forced liquidations. A lot of uh, uh, funds and even private investors were forcedly liquidated if they were leveraged. And that includes also airlines, for example, that they were their leveraged business, which were also uh, technically they were bust, if not of the government intervention. So, um, so this is how it went. And, uh, and now we downgraded our green bus signal to uh, blue bust because uh, there is a lot of uncertainty and uh, we are looking at extr more extreme oversold levels to uh, increase more um, asset exposure on the S&P. But let me go back to this graph. Yeah, if, if, I could, if I could add one point, in addition to the S&P 500, those of, us, uh, those of you who have followed us know that we follow key other asset classes. And what happened in March was not only that we had, uh, of course, a major drawdown on the S&P 500, but there was a period of time where the 10-year treasury yield that before the crisis was closer to 1%, sharply fell to 0.3, as you remember. Now, once it reached 0.3, our signal was suggesting that the 10-year treasury was oversold, or overbought, sorry. Uh, the price went up and the yield fell close to zero, and we also launched a signal that that S&P 500, that that 10 year treasury yield was overbought. And after we sent that signal, there was a very sharp increase in the yield from 30 basis points to 125. Some of that increase was driven by market illiquidity. As we have analyzed, there was a dollar shortage and everybody was dumping not only risky assets, but also safe assets where these freaky uh, three weeks in which literally both risky and safe assets were going down in price. Normally there is a negative correlation, uh, became a positive correlation, but that was driven by market illiquidity. And as soon as the Fed moved to unlimited QE and started providing liquidity both in US and global market through swaps, uh, the yield that they peaked at 125 went back to more normal levels and is right now around 70 basis points. So the signal was suggesting that the 10-year treasury was way overbought when it reached a level of 0 0.3. So we got also that particular signal correct. Uh, back to David. Yeah, thank you, Nouriel. Um, so we, we, uh, back in January, we, uh, we have uh, uh, sent the red boom on uh, the S&P at 3.325. We also sent a signal on Apple at 301. And I remember a lot of friends calling me when Apple went up to like 325 saying, oh, your signal is wrong, your signal is wrong. And uh, well, Apple corrected $100 down, 30% down on the downside. And it's probably a very well capitalized company. They're full of cash, but nevertheless, went down uh, over $100 to 213. 
And this is when basically we sent a blue bus signal because it was not extreme. Apple could have fallen more, but we wanted to uh, inform our subscribers that at 2.13, Apple, uh, based on our model, was oversold. And after that, you've seen it rallied back to over $270, $270. So we, we, we published our sale at 301. We published our buy at um, 213, $213. And then now it rallied back to 270 and now it's in the middle of nowhere, which is about $240, um, 241 uh, for the, uh, right now. So if you look at the graph, and, and just to explain how our model works is, when we had the red boom at 3,325, uh, uh, 3, the volatility of the S&P of the entire market was about 12 to 14%. So a lot of complacency in the market. The market was stretched from a fundamental point of view because it was trading at 200, uh, at, uh, 22, sorry, at 22 uh, P forward earnings for 2020. Uh, for 2020 and uh, uh, our signal catched that oversold situation then the market from the graph you can see how dramatic was the drop dropped 37 percent and vol from 12 percent went to over 80 percent now you can see how our signal looking at volatility also one of the variables it measures and how volatility changes it has pinpoint that because of the change of the volatilities, not only the drop of the market, but the intrinsic change of the volatility, how the volatility was increasing from 14 to 80%, and then the volatility was moving from 70 to 80, from 80 to 50. That change of the volatility fed our model and told our model, this is a bust. It's a green bust. Obviously, the model does not, doesn't know about the exponential growth of the COVID virus. So this is why we are warning that although we're in a bust situation, the model goes back maybe 40 years, 4-0. While this kind of volatility change is the volatility change we saw in 1918, 1930, when none of us were alive and, uh, and, uh, and market were moving 10% in a day, like they did a few weeks ago. So this is, this is something that we have to pay attention. This is why, why Nouriel input is very important also to understand what are the implications in, in the economy of the COVID. So another point which I would like to stress out is how this is a long-term investment model. If you look at the seeds at, at the, of, the, of the red boom and the orange and the green bust, those signals happen every three, four months. This is not a day trading model especially when volatility is below 20%. So we have those extreme situation on the downside or extreme situation on the upside every few months. But on the other hand, when volatility goes up to 80%, we could have signal every few days. So a lot of viewers have asked why I'm, I'm not getting the real time signal. Well, you are getting the real time signal is just that when volatility is low, the signal slows down and gives you a signal every few weeks or every few months. But if you have an increase of the speed of volatility, the signal will be, could be every day. So, so, you're all, so whoever paid for the service is receiving a real-time signal, but it's not that often. And now we had in the last few days, volatility came from, went down to 54% from 80%. So obviously the signal is no longer so that often. Another question that we get is if oil, if everybody talks about oil going to zero, if the world economy is slowing down and Professor Nouriel is so bearish, on the global economy, why do you have a green bust in oil? Two answer. Our first green bust on oil was when oil touched $26.5 the first time. And after that, it rallied 33%. So the price of oil went up 30%. It's up to you when to take profit. We're not gonna tell you every time 
that, okay, you take, because everybody has different portfolio location, everybody have different uh, views, whether you have a long term or short term. We are here to tell you oil is oversold. And at $26, oil was oversold, oversold, and it did go up. Then the second, we had a second leg down of the oil when it went down below 20. And so I had other emails asking me, your signal is wrong. Well, our signal is a statistical mathematical model and is, is, I'm not saying it's wrong. Our signal mentioned an oversold situation and you can continue to be oversold for, for several weeks or even months, depending on the macroeconomics. But at $26, the, the oil was oversold. It did rally 30% from our level. And number two, today is up 30%. So you have to, you have to understand that when there is a global crisis and there is a double or triple black swan in the market and there is dislocation in the market, something can continue to be oversold for several weeks. And we could have also, like they say, they have bull rallies in a bear market or short rallies in a bear market or that cow cat bounce. We could have all of that. But in the long picture, if you look at oil in the past 30 years, at 26, in, I'm looking at under any kind of metrics is oversold. Now, sometimes we have Professor Nuri Rubinik saying that he sees the greater depression, but it's, it's not his base case. And then we see the, mark, the, the signal that is bullish. How is it possible? Well, first of all, I like to have, I like to surround myself with many smart people like Professor Nui Rubini that have different opinion. If you're, if you're in a room and you surround yourself with many people that agree with you, that's not a good meeting. I, I know myself, we like to have different opinion. And when we have like different opinions and the signal is a different opinion from the macroeconomics, we discuss that. So before we send a signal out, we don't just produce it based on the mathematical formulas, but we do talk and we put it in the context of the macro picture. So I like to have Nouriel disagreeing and the more he disagrees, the better. And if we would always agree, then you should not follow our, our system. Then um, one more, one, I want to answer one more question and is again, which I did mention before the beginning of the conference is about the asset class. We are going to increase the number of asset class, but we want to keep also the asset class within the metrics that work better for the signal. And the signal works better for asset class, which are very large. Asset class that can fail, can go bust, can go to zero. And asset class that do not suffer a melt up. So if I take the example of, I would love to use the signal for Tesla, but it's not possible because Tesla is too small is only a hundred million of market cap. And our signal, for example, I did apply to Tesla and at 800 was giving us a red boom. Tesla went over $900. Be why? Because it's a small cap firm. I mean, it's a medium cap firm, only a hundred billion uh, of market worth. And therefore our system does not work well. We have been also approached by Bloomberg, which wants to, uh, um, be a partner with us and we might have also our system uh, in the 320,000 terminals of Bloomberg and we will probably there increase the number of asset class using the same criteria. That's also an option. And um, some people they say why is it so cheap? This is the, the, the signal and we made it as cheap because we wanted to have a sophisticated tools available to the largest public as possible. And we were also considering uh, making it free at one point. Uh, and then we decided just mainly to cover our cost, not our salaries because we're not getting paid, but uh, just the cost of putting up the system and, and sending the, the, the signal to as many people as possible. So I don't know if uh, Nouriel, you're the, the main host. Uh, if you wanna give a, a, a Q and A session, for the yeah, I'll, ma I'll make uh, one final observation. Uh, those who followed what I've written uh, know that I essentially presented uh, three scenarios for the global economy. One is a mild recession, V-shaped recovery in the second half. I do assign only a 
10 to 15 percent probability to that scenario to a greater recession scenario where the recession is going to continue to Q3 and then you get the recovery by Q4. That's a 55 to 60 percent probability. And then a greater depression scenario to which uh, I've assigned 30 percent probability. If you read what I've written together, my colleague uh, Brunel Rosa, those are the probability we assign to these three scenarios. Now, in two out of these three scenarios, the mild recession or the greater recession, the correction or the drawdown is at maximum 40%. If you believe in a V-shaped recovery, by year end, actually the market could be down only 10% for the year. While if you believe in a U-shaped recovery, the greater recession, we go down 40% and by year end will be down 20% because the recovery is going to be gradual, anemic, subpar, painful. But we're not going to have a drawdown bigger than 40%. And at some point uh, in a couple of months, the market is going to recover more robustly rather than having a relief rally, rather than having a debt cut bounce, rather than having a, a head fake rally. It's going to be a more robust, gradual recovery, but we'll be still down 20% for the year because we've caused a lot of damage and the recovery is anemic. It's only in the scenario of a greater depression, 30% probability, that we have not reached the bottom and we can go down 50, 60% and stay there for at least a year or two before the market recovers. The point is that both in the baseline of a greater recession and in the V-shaped recovery, that in our view has a cumulative probability of 70%, 60 for one, 10 for the other, the market doesn't go down more than 40%. As I've said, in one case recovers very fast, uh, in the case of a V-shaped recovery, in the other case recovers less fast and is still down 20% for the year. It's only if you have the greater depression where the market has not reached the bottom and it can go down more like 50 and 60%. We have warned about the factors that can lead to a greater depression, but it is not the baseline. It's a risk, and the probability of it is high. In my view, 30%, but it's 30%, is not 60 like the baseline. So that's a caveat to keep in mind when people say, if you're so bearish, why don't you expect that the market is going to crash another 30%? It's not yet the baseline. If the data suggest that we're going that direction, we're going to change the probabilities and we're going to see another massive drawdown in the data, but that's not the baseline.